So I wanted to do a series that's a little bit more fun. Blips is all fighting for the little guy, and Errant Signal tends to be these high-minded 20-minute video essays on whatever I decide to cover. So I thought I'd look for a way to do something a little bit lighter and fluffier, easier to write and easier to research. And I think I settled on an idea I'd like to try. Inspired by AV Club series like Age of Heroes or Popcorn Champions, I'd like to occasionally pick a concept and a starting point, and then talk about the most important, influential, best, or most interesting example of that concept for each year up until the present. And, because it's an experimental new series I'm trying, and who knows how far it'll even go, I'm starting with something firmly in my wheelhouse that I can write about with my eyes closed. FPS games. And if one is doing a retrospective on the FPS genre, there's a long history of proto-FPS games to potentially start with. There are vector-based arcade titles like Battlezone or 1983's Star Wars game that were played in first person with fully 3D environments. There's a myriad of flight simulators, starting as far back as the early 80s, that try to approximate the experience of sitting in a cockpit, looking over your instrument panel out to the world below. Or you can make an argument to start with turn-based first-person adventure games like Personal Nightmare, or 3D maze games like 3 Demon and Phantom Slayer, popularizing the perspective. There are even early prototypical entries in the genre proper, like Midi Maze, an Atari ST game that allowed players to enter into a 3D world as a 70s-style happy face avatar, and, if they so choose, shoot colored blobs at one another. The point is that first-person as a perspective has been in games a long, long time, much longer than first-person shooters have existed as a solidified, specific genre, and so picking a point to start at is going to be somewhat arbitrary. At the same time, though, there's no denying that the genre as it came to be known really did get solidified in the early 90s at id Software, who will come to dominate the first couple of episodes of this series. Don't worry, there's 30 years of games between then and now, so we'll have plenty of opportunity to look at weirder, experimental, or just generally non-id first-person titles in time. But for now, if we're looking at the origins of the first-person shooter genre, I think it's worth turning our eyes to id's output from 1991. The original first-person game from id chronologically would be Hover Tank, but I'd hesitate to call it a first-person shooter per se. It leans way, way more into the 3D maze genre, with its labyrinthine level design of detailless, samey corridors. It's a game that emphasizes exploration and collecting rather than actual combat. It is also very, very Tom Hall. It's surprising how much of his voice is present in this, actually. His mix of dark nihilism and Saturday morning cartoon comedy shine through here as much as they do in Anachronox or Commander Keen. The premise is that war were declared, and you are Brick Sledge. Yeah, that's a name. A mercenary in possession of a hover tank and some teleporting technology. That combination of tech can allow you to jump into dangerous situations and rescue anyone who is trapped before the bombs get them, then get out and get paid big bucks for doing it. But look out, because there are mutants and tentacle monsters and enemy hover tanks just waiting to blow you up first. So take them out if you can, collect the civilians before they're killed, and find the gateway back to base to get your payday. Interestingly, for an id game, you get story blurbs before each mission that set the scene for what you're doing. For example, rescuing a scientist and his daughter in their rural home, or saving a team of philanthropists who have had a nuclear attack sent on them by big business. I just love how goofy this all is, from the muted, yay, when you save people, <laughs> to the 1950s pulp monsters, to the constant view bob, to the comedic timing of the sound clip when you die. Like I said, it's very Tom Hall, but it's also not very shootery. Enemies all go down in one hit, and there's not really that many of them. It's more about mapping the mazes and dead ends in your head effectively as you explore, than using that mental map and your radar to track down the remaining humans in need of rescue or the exit to the level before time runs out. The monsters in the shooting are mostly just there to give the game a slight difficulty boost and make exploring the repetitive hallways less... Same E. Hover Tank is an interesting footnote, but if you pressed me, I'd have to say the first real first person shooter game produced by id Software was released later that year. Side note, I think it's also worth pointing out how ridiculously fast the turnaround time on games was back in this era. 1991 saw id Software release all Commander Keen games except for the first one, which came out in December of 1990, a 2D platformer game called Shadow Knights, the cult classic Dangerous Dave in the Haunted Mansion, Rescue Rover, Rescue Rover 2, a Mahjong game called Tiles of the Dragon, and the two first-person games we're talking about today, Hover Tank and Catacomb 3D. For context, 
Hover Tank was released in April of 1991, and despite releasing all that other stuff that year, id Software managed to release Catacomb 3D by November of 1991, just seven months later and one month before releasing two Commander Keen games in December. Those are speeds that are just unheard of today, even in most of the indie sphere. Like, outside of Patreon-supported game devs who release experimental projects at a monthly or bi-monthly basis, no one works at that speed anymore. So just remember it's a different world. Anyways, in November of 1991, it released Catacomb 3D, and it is exactly what that sounds like. A port of Catacomb, but in 3D. Maybe we should back up. The original Catacomb, developed by future IT alumni while working for Softdisk, and published under Softdisk's label in 1990, was basically a riff on Gauntlet. It's a top-down, dungeon-crawling action game where the player character, a mage named Petten Everhale, gotta love these names, explores a castle and shoots magic missile blasts at various fantasy nasties while collecting treasure on his way to defeat the evil lich called Nemesis. There are keys to find to unlock doors, health potions that can heal your wounds, ammunition for more powerful spells that you can pick up, and secret pathways that can be opened if you fire your magic at the right tiles. It had something of an even split between exploration and action, blasting down hallways where lots of monsters charge at you in order to find the key that opens up the other wing of the level you're on. And just... Describing all of that out loud kind of explains how this sets the stage for the id model of the early 90s shooter. Catacomb 3D is that game turned into a first-person experience. To a fault. Like, pretty much every mechanic from Catacomb is translated very loyally and literally to Catacomb 3D. The bolts that make you shoot fast for a little bit? Sure. The nuke spell that fires off blasts in all directions, which for an early first-person game is particularly weird? Yeah, that's there. The weird charging blast thing that never does enough damage to make charging the blast worth it, making machine gun spamming blasts way more effective. Yeah, yeah, still do that. Even the false walls that need to be shot to reveal what's behind them, not yet as a means of video game secrets, but as a means of progression, which doesn't really work in a first person game since you can't see the whole map like you can in the top down original. All of that stuff is here and it's all taken directly from Catacomb. According to David Kushner's Masters of Doom, the project largely came about because John Romero had heard from Looking Glass, nay Blue Sky Productions, developer Paul Nureth that the upcoming Ultima Underworld would have texture mapping, to which John Carmack replied, I can do that. Apparently Nureth disputes this retelling and says that Romero and Carmack saw Ultima Underworld at CES in the summer of 1990, and that Carmack said he could do the same thing but faster there on the show floor. Either way though, Catacomb 3D certainly feels like what both anecdotes paint it as a direct and very literal port of one of their existing games to a 3D first-person perspective in order to prove Carmack's engine writing chops more than out of a driven and passionate desire to make another Catacomb game. The humor and writing that filled Hover Tank are gone and replaced with a cut-to-the-bone formalism. What's fascinating is that these decisions, the choice to focus on frame rate and up-tempo gameplay instead of a true immersive 3D space like Ultima Underworld, and the choice to map their action-y top-down shooter to a first-person perspective, both would lead to the Hallmark id style for years after this. And it's fascinating to me because, like, before we even have first-person shooters or immersive sims as we know them, we kind of have this philosophical divide between the slower, more systems-driven, role-playing-oriented approach to first-person games that Blue Sky Productions was taking with Ultima Underworld, and the comparatively rapid-paced action blaster of Catacomb 3D. But that abstract, gameplay-centric approach freed the team at id to be a lot more playful in its level design. Things didn't need to make sense or function as a literal space. You could have dark catacombs, sludge-filled walls, or bloody torture chambers all butting up against one another. It didn't matter. It also let them build levels that were more playful from a design perspective. As discussed, one level will straight up block your progress if you don't realize that you can shoot walls to uncover secret passageways. There's the access level that has portals to four other levels, breaking up the linear nature of the game and allowing you to choose where to go next. One level is a sprawling maze of near-identical rooms, some levels are just combat-intensive levels, and another maze has endless corridors of green prison cells asking you to find its true exit. Each map kind of has a hook or a gameplay gimmick associated with it, where the level design itself becomes something of the featured player. That's not really something that happened in Hover Tank. And it's also not something that really happened in Ultima Underworld, where the focus was less on toying with core mechanics and its level design than presenting you with a believable underground cavern world. Still, there are reasons that Catacomb 3D is largely ignored when looking back at the genre. For one, it's not very good at being a shooter. 
Unlike Hover Tank, enemies take multiple blasts, but the tuning is all wrong. Your charge move is too weak and takes too long to charge to make it worth doing, so you just end up spamming regular attacks as fast as humanly possible. And it turns out that taking Gauntlet Arcade Booth style button mashing and just asking you to do that but in first person isn't particularly engaging first person combat. Plus, the speed at which you turn is so slow that combat itself becomes really dangerous. Monsters tend to run close enough to you that they pass through you and become invisible, and turning to face them takes entirely too long. The field of view is also all screwed up. Simply rotating while standing in place will reveal what's around corners, which is disorienting and feels like you're always kind of like leaning forward. And as much as Bobby Prince has put out some real bangers in his career, the music here is... But if you can look past all that, you can clearly see the seeds of what was to come, taking a top-down shooter design and applying it to a first-person perspective, with a focus on abstract spaces that are designed to play off the game's core mechanics rather than constructing a fictional world, with color-coded locks and keys and ammo pickups and health packs and fast-paced action. Hover Tank may have been id's first first-person game, but it was Catacomb 3D that was id's original first-person shooter. Next time, we go to 1992 and talk about Wolfenstein 3D's contributions and regressions. Bear with me and we'll get through the id games soon enough.